All right, everyone, there is a huge development within Korea, and it's a positive one. This is another step, you know, towards hopefully having peace within the region. One small step for the Korean Peninsula, one giant leap for the world, you know, hoping to, to clear up a long-standing, simmering issue since the 19-fucking-50s, which, uh, you know, it's, it is kudos to Trump. South Korea's uh, president's giving him praise, saying he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, I already said, of course. The Nobel Prize means nothing anymore, uh, you know, mainly because Obama got one for not being George W. Bush and not having an R after his name, and that was all very funny. And at the time, it's like, yeah, come on. And at the time, I was like still mildly in support of Obama, and even then, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? What's he done? Okay, he's not Bush. There are other people in the world that aren't Bush. Give them a Nobel Prize, too. Uh, but North Korea is planning to dismantle its former nuke site now on this site. We have to navigate the waters between two uh, dichotomous camps. One which says, this is all Trump, it's wonderful, this is highly significant, and the other saying, well, you know, they blew up their own nuke site basically anyway and it collapsed, they're just decommissioning it because they can't use it anymore. Somewhere in between the two, there is truth. Uh, if North Korea intended to, it could simply make a new nuke site, probably not <laughs> there, working through contaminated soil that's unstable and cracked and falling apart and, you know, all, all sorts of messed up and probably glows in the dark at night by this point. Uh, not there, but they could certainly dig in a new test site if they intended to continue their development. The fact that they're planning to decommission this before the summit is a really good sign. It's just like the release of the prisoners. The U.S. hasn't given Korea anything. The South Koreans have stopped their propaganda broadcasts. So, too, by the way, did North Korea. Then they met together, and, and there's, you know, that sort of warm brotherhood feeling, I guess, to, extent, to the extent that it can exist between these two particular individuals. At the, at the very least, you know, they live on the same peninsula. They're of the same background. North and South Korea are national, uh, but it has nothing to do with ethnicity. They're, they're Korean. <laughs> Even if they've diverged, I'm sure, by now, because North Korea, it's like, totally, only the strongest will survive. Trust us, because if you're not, we'll work you to death or kill you. And South Korea, it's more like, you know, it's more westernized after a fashion. But the dismantling of the nuke site before the summit specifically is, uh, is highly relevant. It is. It's not entirely a case of, well, Trump came in and threatened North Korea and so they shut down their nuke program. It's, it's not like that. Part of it is that they collapsed their test site. But this shows that Kim Jong-un has taken stock of the situation, looked at what the U.S. has done and said, South Korea, China, he's met with uh, Jinping, I think, twice as well uh, prior to the summit already. He took stock of the situation and decided the amount of money and effort and time necessary to dig in a new test site wasn't worth it. So he's saying, fuck it, decommissioning that site. Now you've got, by the way, the U.S. through Pompeo, and also, I, I think, Macron, the French are on board. The idea that the DPRK should give up several nuclear devices before the summit. I, if that actually happens, I'll be pleasantly surprised. I don't think that's likely. I think, by the way, I think going in hard right now is not a great idea. You may end up with a summit that's just Seoul, Pyongyang, and Beijing meeting together, and the U.S. really sidelined. I think it's better to continue the, the warm, friendly approach at this point more. But if they can, maybe they've already gotten a guarantee. Here's, here's a theory. Here's one possibility, and if it's true, I'm going to laugh my ass off. If, if the nukes are given up, and they're sent to France to be you know, inspected and destroyed, essentially, the French will turn it into nuclear energy or whatever, pay them for it. If that happens, I, I'll tell you why it will have happened. It means that Pompeo already arranged for it to happen, and he's simply putting it out there now to make the Trump admin look good if it does. If it happens, if not, then, you know, all bets are off at that point. But if it happens, it won't be just a show of grace. It'll have been agreed upon already, and what you're seeing is a floor show, essentially a Shakespearean sort of situation in which all the agreements have been made, all the deals have been struck, and judging from the elated behavior of South Korea's president, probably involves denuclearization, probably involves reunifying the peninsula. It's literally the best possible scenario. No more risk of a, of a nuclear conflict over what is essentially, a, I mean, it's a half century old, at this point, totally fucking uh, a moronic war anyway. There's no point to it. They've been sitting there with their guns and artillery drawn up for decades and decades for no reason. 
and exhausting, by the way, millions of North Koreans in the process with the ever-present threat of something going wrong and leading to a catastrophe with several tens of millions of people killed. It is dumb to have a Korean war at this point. Most of the people alive on either side of the DMZ, they, they weren't even around in a time where their country technically wasn't at war, in a brother's war with the other half of Korea. It's the fucking point. And it's pointless for the U.S. to dickwag after them at this point, too. I don't even... By the way, I'll, I'll put this out there. If the eventual deal involved Korea reunifies and remains a nuclear state with a few hydrogen bombs, who cares? Who cares? You know, do you really worry about them offensively attacking anyone at that point? Anyway, it's going to be run by a, a westernized government. It's not going to be run by Juche. It's not going to be run by communism. And at most, it'd be like a mixed a Chinese-style state. No one worries about that. It's inconsequential. Who cares? I'm much more worried about uh, uh, other nuclear powers like China. Has problems at this point with Vietnam. Its its sphere has shifted. So parts of Asia are no longer on its team that were reliably Chinese assets or in their sphere at least. Like the Philippines, Duterte's like fuck off. The Vietnamese government's like fuck off. Uh, Taiwan's like, you know, this is still screw off, you know, many, many years later. Uh, they're too busy colonizing East Africa at this point. I'm more worried about them making a mistake and, you know, having a problem. Or, or to tell the truth, Pakistan. I think Pakistan could, could have problems because they have con constant problems with militias. What if some militia uprising manages to unseat the government? Then all of a sudden you get a hardline bunch of fanatics in control of, a, of 150, you know, H-bombs. I think that could be a little problem. India. Now, Modi may be sane, but I mean a nationalistic movement of his type. Uh, disenfranchising, as it were, both the Muslim minority and communist movements within India. That could be a problem, too. I wouldn't worry about a unified Korea. It'd be, it'd be totally stable. Plus, it'd be a huge opportunity. Look, North Korea within a decade would be unrecognizable. And everyone there would be real, real fucking happy and, and probably you'd have 99% of approval of whatever government happens because they'd be eating 10 times as much food and everything would be hunky-dory. Meanwhile, South Korea's upper classes would be investing in that infrastructure. D.C. certainly would be a huge opportunity for us. It would be a huge opportunity for Chinese investors too. Korea would become uh, Japan 2.0. At this point, Shinzo Abe and the Japanese are more likely to try to stymie any resultant deal than anyone else. And then even Kim Jong-un, because they're like, oh, oh, you mean you want to have another country roughly similar at that point in size to us with a huge number of natural resources and a huge potential for growth. You're going to fuse these that with a, a hyper first world, extremely technologically developed nation, and it'll have nukes. And I think at that point, uh, Shinzo Abe will want nukes, too. I think Japan will want to have You'll end up with a secondary conflict of Japan demands to have the same nuclear capabilities as Korea or something. And then probably the Chinese will come in at that point and say, oh, yeah, we, we back your claim. You know, shame on you, D.C., for disenfranchising one of your greatest allies. And it'll all be very surreal, but at least there won't be a Korean war going on. So they're dismantling their nuke site. Trump does get praise. He will get credit for that. It is important. And when if the summit goes off well, if a, if a peace treaty is signed at the summit, officially ending the Korean War and beginning, you know, uh, bilateral talks of, hey, going forward, what are we going to do? Are we going to have, like, you know, one Korea? Or what are we going to do about this? What government form does it take? What about, you know, the human rights abuses? Uh, going forward, if that happens, uh, that turns uh, foreign policy success into a monumental foreign policy success. And it would virtually assure that the Nobel Prize goes, you know, in part to Trump. Which would be funny. It'd be funny to see him. He, he goes and accepts it and says, well, you know, I'll take the money because I'm Donald Trump and I love money. Uh, and then he just, he takes it and he starts rolling it and smoking it. And then he hands Jeff Sessions off the pot bag and they get high uh, in front of the Nobel Committee. That'd be the best thing for the country. It'd be a symbol of progress, I think. That's about all. Peace out.